Hello, everybody. Welcome to our roundtable number one with our special guest, Garo Pailan. Uh, Mr. Pailan, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, this is our first roundtable. Uh, it's a new format that we are doing here in Bright Garden Voices. Um, first of all, Bright Garden Voices, for those joining us for the first time, is a, flat, a platform for dialogue between Armenians, Azerbaijanis, and other people involved in the in the issues between these countries um, or interested in the in the in the region as well and in this format we invite people um, either who are part of our network or, or not to submit their questions to our guest um, and we will moderate those questions uh, selecting some of them and inviting the people who want to ask them to ask them face to face to our guest um, I, I will be saying whose turn it is to ask a question and which of the questions they submitted it, it should be. Um, and uh, you can have a follow-up question related to the same question. If it's by somebody else than the original person who wrote the question, you can send it to me privately on the chat and I will say um, if it's your turn or not to, to say it. And um, we will try to follow some kind of order in the topics. We might go a little bit back and forth, but we don't want to um, overload uh, uh, one topic in particular. Although, of course, we are focusing more on what's more related to our um, platform, which is uh, Armenian Azerbaijani issues and Armenia Turkey mostly in this case as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for joining and we will start already with the first question. So for the first question, um, I would like to invite, uh, is Bachrus in here already? Yes, yeah. he just joined. So Bachrus, um, I would like to invite you to unmute yourself, turn on your camera and ask the question you have submitted. Hello and everyone. Also, Sorry, introduce yourself as well, everybody, when you, yes. when you start. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Bahru Sabadov. I teach political theory at Charles University in Prague. I am a PhD candidate. I write a dissertation about national social imaginary in Azerbaijan and about Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, authoritarianism in Azerbaijan. Uh, I would like to say thank you to the organizers, to Garo Pailan, who joined us uh, today. It's incredible to have this chance to ask the question here directly. Uh, I would like to ask uh, one question. I think it's, uh, yeah, it, it's a part of my, let's say, methodology, how I work uh, in this field, I would say. It's, I would tell, I, I would call it uh, attempt to humanize the other. So basically the question is, do you think that, uh, what is the best way to, uh, achieve a uh, certain kind of trust between uh, the communities, I mean, Armenian, Azerbaijani communities. And do you think that the best way is uh, to agree on the crimes of the past that, uh, or, or acknowledge, uh, rather, right, acknowledge the uh, wrongdoings of the past from the both sides and to say that there is not a single victim there is not a single uh enemy there is no so there is no evil and uh good side right it's, it's rather complex and do, don't you think that this complexification of this uh images image image of the past is best way to achieve peace because i think that the main problem for our communities is that we are stuck in the past, right? There's there's like this like social trauma, the identity building stuff, and uh, is, or do you think that is the best way to not to think that much about the past and to to see to look forward uh, and to uh, and to be focused more on the future? So, uh, is it what do you think? Which way is the best way to? uh build trust between our communities thank you so much thank you very much Bahrus, and thank you everyone parev says hepinize merhabalar thank you for this you know, occasion um Bahrus, now this is a very important question and uh, that's what i'm thinking i'm working on for decades i have been you now struggling in turkey uh 
to find justice in the past, of course, one of my issues was, but I was not stuck in the past, no. I knew that we had a future and uh, the, the, we, we need to build a future, you know, and that future needs to be, you know, uh, uh, in the basis of democracy. And uh, I believed in coexistence. Those are, were the romantic dreams. We were about to be there in Turkey up now until 2015. But unfortunately, the last eight years, Turkey is deteriorating again. Now look at our situation. Armenians are trying to prove that something bad have happened in 1915 and afterwards unpunished crimes lead to new crimes and we are always suffer suffering. But Armenians unfortunately got stuck in this victimhood. And uh, they put, let's say, in, especially in the diaspora, 90% of their energy to punish Turks, uh, Turkish identity or Turkish you know, perpetrators of the genocide. And uh, they forgot uh, to do to centralize on the future. Now look where we are. You know, uh, we even Mr. Biden said that it is a genocide, but it didn't avoid the coming uh, hatred. You know, uh, cycle hit uh, Nagorno Karabakh Armenians. So this means, I guess, something is mit missing. So I never will say I'm just going to forget. I will never forget what have happened to my grandparents or uh, Azeri will never forget what have happened to them in 1992 or Armenians will never forget what have happened to them in 2020 or 2023 when they were you know, for forced to flee their motherland. We, we should not forget. But this doesn't mean that if you don't acknowledge my pain, I will never talk to you. This this. This is a great example. Turkish you know, example is a great example. We just tried to punish Turkey for this, but we have nothing in our hand. So uh, I believe first we need to engage. We need to get to know each other. We need to have you know, uh, relations. Uh, then we need to start the reconciliation processes at the same time. But we shouldn't have preconditions like, if you don't recognize my pain, I'm not going to speak to you. Then it, uh, we start the race of you know, uh, pains. You no, know, you killed me there. You killed me 30 years ago. I killed you th th that time. It doesn't help us. Uh, each pain needs to be recognized or reconciled you know, in, in, in different chap chapters. You no, know? but you no, know, we should start to engage. I guess where we need to start the process should be the engage, opening the borders, engaging, uh, uh, and starting reconcil reconciliation processes. And we should not leave anything to the politicians especially the new generation need to take responsibility to engage with uh, once uh, you lived uh, for centuries. No, uh, because the politicians filled uh, the new generations with ha hatred uh, for generations this has been going on. And, but the new generation needs to take responsibility that to show that uh, they can coexist again together. Thank you. Thank you, Gado. Um, I don't know, uh, Vakdus, if you have any follow-up question on the topic. Otherwise, um, I would like to invite Mane to ask her question because it's kind of on the same topic. So, Mane. Thank you, Diego. Um, hi, everybody. I want to thank Gado for uh, taking his time to join us. I think this is going to be a great experience for everybody. And uh, will briefly introduce myself. I'm uh, Mana, I work in uh, business specifically in the digital and technology field. So not, not a policy student, uh, but uh, in my long experience, I've worked for, uh, with colleagues in large teams, both from Azerbaijan, Turkey, Armenia, Central Asian countries. So I have direct contact with uh, a lot of people from all the countries. And my question is actually correctly, uh, quite a follow-up to Baruch's question. And my question is the following. Uh, Gara, do you, I think you are uniquely positioned actually to answer this question. Do you think, um, how big do you think 
the question of the Armenian genocide currently is how central and how, what kind of size does this question have to Turkish identity? And on the other side, do you think that Armenians, because you have contacts with our diaspora, you have obviously you've spent your career in Turkey and you are personally also affected by this. So do you think Armenians overestimate or underestimate how central this question is to Turkish identity, to Turkish politics, kind of the self-identification? Thank you. Um, Turkish, uh, uh, let's say, identity is built on the... Um, um, uh, 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 let's say uh, the, uh, the fathers of the uh, no, Turkish identity uh, knew this. You no, know, Turkey's population was a diverse population, and almost half of the population was you no know, uh, Christians and Jews, and uh, they needed to build a nation. But that identity needs to. There, are, there were several Muslim identities and Christian identities, so they just uh, targeted uh, the Christians and Jews uh, as an enemy, and uh, uh, and put it uh, as a uh, no uh, um, uh, as an enemy, and they just uh, uh, um, just. Uh, co consolidated all the uh, Muslim identities under the umbrella of Turkishness. There were uh, no so many identities, Muslim identities, but they just said, uh, you are going to be the under the umbrella of Turkishness and Christians are, the, are our enemies. And uh, Armenian genocide is the starting point, I guess the most important crime uh, uh, during this, uh, no, uh, during this Turkish identity, uh, no, uh, architecture pr process, the most important crime was the Armenian genocide, and moreover, uh, denial of the Armenian genocide is the most important process of the Turkish history. We cannot ignore this, of course. But you know this has been going for 100 years. Let's say only 20 years ago, when Turkey had a European Union process, uh, none of the people knew about the Armenian genocide in Turkey because there was a huge denial. But we started talking about it. We started talking about our grandparents' stories. You know, Hranting started to do it, and I continued to, to do that. And people had some kind of empathy with the Armenians. Then they remembered. Of course, I mean, whatever Armenians suffered was a big crime. But afterwards, Alavid, Alavid suffered the same crimes and Kurds suffered it. Also, the, uh, they say conservative Muslims as well, because of the headscarf head issue, they suffered uh, what the state had told them to be. So there was an empathy for 20 years. Uh, they were ready to say, that something bad has happened without naming it the, with the genocide. But unfortunately, after 2015, uh, Turkish establishment took the uh, no, power uh, to their hand again, and those processes have ended, unfortunately. So those years, we started to engage with the Turks, let's say. I, I was vocal, Hranting was vocal, and we could, we could really commemorate Armenian genocide at the Taksim Square, which is the main square of Turkey, let's say. This was huge, this was big, we, but we, took, we didn't give any credit. I told all the Armenians that this is, a, uh, this is a great process, we need to take part of it. But no, we, have, we, we, have, we were biased and we had all the reasons to be biased. Now coming back to the Armenian side, Armenian identity, uh, is got, got stuck in 1915, and Armenia uh, got stuck there, and diaspora is there as well. And they put 90% of their energy to just, uh, to just uh, past. But, you know, without having a future, without building leverage, without being strong, 
you cannot find justice in the past. That is for sure. No, no, no. AZDs have suffered 14 genocides in this 1,000 years, but nobody cares about their genocides. They say concern, deep concern, we are so sorry about it. And Kurds have suffered several massacres, but nobody cares about them. Look at Palestinians. This is a this is a ethnic cleansing. This is almost a genocide, what they are suffering now. But unfortunately, nobody cares about them so much. But because they don't have money, they don't have leverage, they don't have anything. So no, nobody is paying, uh, giving enough interest to save them. So we have to take a lesson out of it. If you don't have a future, you can't find justice in the past. And even we waited for 100 years uh, money, but even if we wait 100 more years, Turkey will have this strategic importance and will not face the Armenian genocide at all. So we first, we need to focus on future. We need to engage with the Turkish people, then start to tell about our sufferings. Then if we can find empathy with the Turks, which we found only 10 years ago, we can convince them to face uh, the Armenian genocide, which is going to heal us, first of all, and, but heal the Turks at the same time, because unpunished crimes always leads to new crimes. It is uh, 100 years ago, it was against Armenians. Uh, then it can be again against other identities as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Adam, I will invite you to um, introduce yourself and maybe ask the first question that you had submitted about Turkey Armenia. Uh, can anybody hear me, see me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, everyone, and especially thank you, Mr. Pailan. It's obviously an honor to meet you. My name is Aram Amir Bekian. I'm a journalist, an independent journalist uh, based in Yerevan, Armenia. So um, my question, the first question that uh, Diego mentioned, was about the Turkish-Armenian normalization process, because there have been multiple meetings, um, there have also been statements, but the statements have been somewhat vague. So I was wondering, what do you think the conditions are for Turkey to normalize the relations with Armenia and open the borders? And what Turkey wants from Armenia in a nutshell, like what Turkey ex expects uh, and the Turkish government specifically for Armenia to open, uh, for for them to, for Armenia to do so that they can open the borders and normalize the relations, because the conditions have been publicly stated, but in a very vague manner. So I was wondering if you had any insight. Of course, um, as I told, after 2015, Turkey got Turkish uh, politics got stuck in nationalism. Unfortunately, before that, we were benefiting from. Uh, peace processes, European Union processes, but all of them ended. And now we have an authoritarian regime, which is allies with the hardliners, now ultra-nationalists. Uh, so they have uh, no uh, nationalist dreams, pan turkic pan -Turkic dreams, you know, like, you know, of course, getting back you know, Nagorno-Karabakh, which ended with a catastrophe, as you know, but it is not over. Now Armenia is at stake, as you know, uh, as Talat Pasha and Emir Pasha had that dream, Panturanist dreams to unite the Turkish world, whatever, and they want Zengezur, so-called Zengezur corridor now. But no, I but I I gave them this example. Let's say Turkish rational Turks and rational Azeris and rational Armenians. I always give this example. Uh, we had republics in 1918 the first Azerbaijan and first Armenian republics. And they were very happy to have republics. It was, it was the first republics of Azeris and Armenians. 
instead of you know, uh, finding a way for a coexistence and live together and regionalize uh, uh, a regional economic whatever uh, uh, agreements or trade this and that they start to fight with each other uh, but I know, I guess there was a Russian finger in it, you know, Bolshevik finger in it. They, uh, Turks, Armenians, and Azeris fought with each other in 1918, 1919, 20. They massacred each other. But what happened afterwards? Russians came and took everything over. You know, we lost the first Azerbaijan and first Armenia, and it uh, it was under the Russian uh, control for seven decades. And then we somehow, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we we had you no know, Armenia and Azerbaijan. But we started to fight again. You know, unfortunately, we massacred each other, killed each other, and uh, just terrible catastrophes. Who benefited from it? Again, Russians you know only. They had the huge whole control in the region because of the fear coming from Turkey and Azerbaijan. Armenia gave all the borders controls to Russia, and Ar Ar Armenian uh, politics is controlled by Russia for three de de decades. We, we thought we had some kind of uh, independent Armenia, but it was so much dependent on Russia, militarily, economically, and by all means dependent on Russia. Now, Azeris are making the same mistake, like, like we did in 1990s. They are just saying, oh, we have maximalist demands. And unfortunately, Turkish nationalists are like them, like Talat Pasha and Mar Pasha. Okay, we are going to open the Turkic border, Turkic corridor. But who's benefiting, going to benefit from it? I don't think no, neither uh, Azeris nor Armenians won't be benefit from it. Because this is the Russian plan to control the Zengazur corridor because it is going to be the new Silk Road. Only Russians and Chinese and are going to benefit. And it is going to be an authoritarian road, which Armenians and Azeris will forever fight. And then Russians, I know, will going to start arming Armenians to prepare the coming revenge, which is going to happen in 10 years, 20 years, whatever. So we need to end this vicious cycle. I am trying to convince Turks to open the border, Turkey, open the border, engage with Armenians and uh, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan to sign the peace deal. But no, unfortunately, we had the civil society 10 years ago, but Erdogan demolished all, all the civil society. We had the media actors, let's say, during the uh, football diplomacy in 2008. And there were hundreds of actors, journalists in, during that process. Now, all of them are either jailed or left, left the country, unfortunately. So I guess you need to, as I, I see there are so many young Azeris, Turks, and uh, Armenians here, you need to take responsibility now. Because Turkey uh, had promised to open the border this June, as you know, but, but they are still waiting because they don't have an independent Caucasus policy. Azerbaijan is ruling the Turkish you know, Caucasus policy. They say, you are going to do it or do not do it whenever I want. So Turkey uh, needs to open this border and needs to engage and Azerbaijan needs to green light it. You know, if the, Turkey doesn't have a policy about it, needs to green light it. Because putting so much pressure on a country or humiliating a country creates what? We saw this in the Azerbaijani regime. We humiliated Azeris, we created the Azeri nation, and Aliyev benefited from it and filled the new nations with hatred and hit, it hit us with a boomerang effect 35, 28 years later. Now, I believe Azeris or Azerbaijani you know, government shouldn't put this pressure over Armenia and just sign the peace deal, respect each other, and open the all the roads, which is going to be beneficial to everyone. Turkey is not there, unfortunately, but I am, and people like me should try to convince uh, Turkey to open the border, first of all. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, maybe you wanna follow up with your third question because it's kind of related. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, my third question was like exactly about something that you mentioned about Azerbaijan kind of green lighting the Turkish policy in South Caucasus. Um, so uh, I was wondering the what the economic, political and um, also kind of in the media, you know, in the media, like what kind of economic, political and media leverage um, Azerbaijan has over Turkey, like in Turkey. Uh, because I have also heard reports about, you know, Azerbaijani, uh, the Azerbaijani government, the regime, I don't know, buying uh, several mm -hmm. media sources. And I was wondering how much the Azerbaijani leverage uh, is influencing the Turkish policies uh, over uh, the South Caucasus and generally like in the normalization process between Armenia and Turkey. Uh Azerbaijan, Aram, Azerbaijan have built so much leverage in the Turkish politics. You no, know? uh, they have so so many media sources, televisions, newspapers, uh, social media networks, and you know they are just. Uh, I don't know how to say it, but they are just. Uh, of course, there are nationalist commentators on TV, but what I hear is you no. Know, they are uh, Azerbaijan is paying them money to somehow, uh, as you know, uh, they, they call it. A, I don't know how we are diplomacy, but a how we are diplomacy, whatever. You no. Know. Um, so whenever there is a machine in Ankara, media machine, whenever they need, they press the button for that media machine to work in favor of Azerbaijan and and to use hate speeches against Armenians. It happened before the 2020 war. A month before that war, I saw that that machine have started to, uh, started to <coughs> on the media saying that, oh, Armenians are this, that, with hate speeches. And I knew that something is about to come. And afterwards, you no, know, before this 2023 uh, war as well, there were again hate speeches in 2022 as well. And after 2020 war, war they started to outlet about Zengezur corridor. But luckily, we just avoided uh, the coming uh, war for now. But anytime they can use that machine. Now, what I just uh, I'm just going to say is this: No, Azerbaijan has huge leverage over Turkish media and Turkish economy. They invested so much there, and uh, there is a nationalist you no know, atmosphere in the Turkish politics. And they, because they can't deliver welfare to the Turkish people, instead they show, oh, we got Nagorno Karabakh, we are in Syria, we are beating Kurds in the Aegean Sea, we are just uh, threatening. Greeks, let's say, three cards, as you know, Turkey historically has three enemies, you no know, so-called enemies, Greeks, Kurds, and Armenians. Whenever they feel that, you no, know, they need to raise nationalism uh, or uh, nationalism card, they use one of these cards, and Armenians are unfortunately one of these cards. So what I offered to the Armenian nation is this. If we just Peace is a necessity for Armenia, but it is not a necessity for Turks or Azeris because it is it is a geography which is surrounded by autocratic regimes, and Armenia doesn't have an oil uh, or gas. It 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 can only uh, you no know, be a strong country with it, with democracy, but you know uh, these hatred cycles hit Armenia more and more, unfortunately. So if we want to save Armenia, we need to end these hatred cycles between Azerbaijan and Armenia and between Turkey and Armenia. It is going to be more beneficial uh, for us. And I, what I suggest is this, if Azeris also want peace, they should really uh, not use this media machine to fill the you no know, Azeris or Turks with hatred of Armenians. They should stop doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Aram. Thank you both. Uh, Arnold, our own Arnold has the next question. Thank you, Mr. Pailan, for joining us. Uh, you know, it was actually, it took a long time to get you on. 
for two years we've been trying <laughs> uh, you know talking to people if it's a good time to have you on the program um Mr. Poylan, I wanted to ask about uh, Turkish civil society, as you mentioned, you know, we have this authoritarian turn with Erdogan and, but, you know, beginning with the 2020 war and afterwards, uh, it seems that at least uh, a lot of the progressive actors, et cetera, in Turkish civil society, which are still there to some degree, have largely ignored the whole conflict, Armenia, Azerbaijan, the region, or I'm not sure if, uh, if this is accurate, at least, you know, the English speaking uh, portions of it. Uh, uh, I was just wondering what the reason is. Is it just the overall authoritarian turn? Do they have bigger domestic issues to worry about? Uh, because sometimes I see Turkish civil society does engage more perhaps in the Balkans, et cetera, in those regions, but uh, yeah, I was wondering what the reason is and uh, how how much they can contribute to this uh, region. Arnold, <laughs> that civil society that you knew, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, all of them are shut down by Erdogan. No, all of them, almost. And as you know, there is a very important actor, Osman Kavala. You know, he has been he is in jail for seven years. You know, and. Uh, all the institutions are, are not functioning now in the civil society, unfortunately. And the progressive ones are not functioning, unfortunately, but the nationalist ones are functioning. So Erdogan's regime have civil society, uh, which are affiliated with the government, and their uh, vision is nationalist and Islamist. You know? They have no neo Ottoman dreams. But no, I tell them Ottoman was not like this. Ottoman was a Ottoman Empire was a diverse empire, empire, which somehow, of course, there was not equality, but we somehow you know, could live in it for for seven centuries, let's say, without, of course, there were some problems, but we could live, coexist with Turks, Kurds, Greeks, and others. If you have an Ottoman dream, neo-Ottoman dream, neo-Ottoman dream, Ottoman was not like this, something like this, uh, now feeling the native generation's hatred of Armenians. Ottoman had so many P Armenians, Greeks in their bureaucracy, you no, know? even foreign ministers and others, you no. Know? So I guess there is something wrong with this neo-Ottoman dream. So the, uh, there are some, you no. Know, civil society uh, no, uh, organizations, which are nationalists. But I tell them, even if you are nationalist, you you want to, what do you want? You want to peace in, if you want peace in the region or deliver welfare to, the, to your people, this requires peace and trade with your neighbors. You no, know? your, what you did in Syria, demolished Syria with you no know, Islamist dreams, as you know, Erdogan would be the leader of the Sunni world. Look where Syria is. Now, United States and Russia is in Syria, so all, all demolished country. And Iraq, you look at Iraq, you know, they don't want Kurds to have any kind of autonomy in Iraq or Syria. That is why they are putting pressure on Iraq and Syria. So uh, all of them are under rebels nowadays, Syria and Iraq. And look at Iran you know, uh, and uh, Armenia. Now, Turkey has problems with all its neighbors, with Greek, let's say, they have problems. Because, but the reason is what? The reason is this ultra-nationalist vision. And Turkey is a key country, Arnold. Let's say 10 years ago, you know, when Turkey was in a democratic way, you know, all of the neighbors were happier, let's say, 15 years ago, let's say. But when Turkey left that path and turned into a you know, ultra-nationalist and Islamic way, look where we are you know, again. So I, I believe Turkey, uh, you know, have, uh, Turkey needs to uh, turn back to democracy. But unfortunately, I don't have hope not for that because Erdogan is walking on Abdul Hamid's way. Do you know Sultan Abdul Hamid's way? But the opposition camp is walking on Talat Pasha and Emmer Pasha's way, unfortunately. Look, the opposition have dared to make a coalition with, uh, let's say, Ümit Özdağ's party to give him the interior ministry. 
Uh, for the short term, I don't have that hope, but we are struggling to make Turkey as a democratic country. If not, I guess things are not going to be settled in Caucasus, in the Middle East, and in the Aegean Sea as well. Thank you. Thank you. Nana Grigorian, I would like to invite you to uh, turn your microphone and camera on to ask your question next. If you're there, yep. yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nana uh, from the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, I'm just studying in a high school, uh, but I'm really interested in politics. Um, so it's hopefully it's going to be my future prof profession. Um, I want to thank you a lot. I thank all of you for this great opportunity. It's a great pleasure for me meet uh, all of you here. And it's really nice to hear uh, all of your opinions. Um, my, and my question is the following. Uh, I would like to, um, to hear your opinion, uh, to hear your thoughts on the role of international bodies and neighboring nations in mediating or influencing the ongoing conflict, conflict or um, tensions in the region. Um, thank you, Nana. Um, you know what? My ideal is, uh, Nana, uh, to regionalize the conflict. Uh, let's say the region means South Caucasus, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Now, in an ideal world, I guess uh, these nations, these countries need to regionalize the conflict. Because whenever you let's say, internationalize this conflict. As you know, these three countries are small countries, Azerbaijan, Az Armenia, and Georgia. Whenever you uh, internationalize this conflict, other big powers have interest in this region. Russia says, oh, it's my back garden. I am the boss of South Caucasus. I'll just rule South Caucasus. Or Iran says, no, I'm, I have a huge influence over Caucasus. Now I'm just going to rule Caucasus. And Turkey says, oh, it is a Turkic world. No, I'm just going to rule the South Caucasus. Then things, no, th these interests are no, not in, in walking in the same way. As you know, they, the, 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 the position, then they mess things up, as you know, these three, three countries. Russia, Iran, and Turkey, which has amb ambitions over South Caucasus. So I believe we need to regionalize this conflict and try to engage, try to sign peace deals, and we shouldn't leave everything to the politicians, civil society, and all. The, every, everybody needs to contribute to for reconciliation processes. But what other countries' role should be, I, I think, this. If we regionalize the conflict, the other countries, let's say, Europe, European Union, can really, uh, you do, uh, let's say, I guess for the short term, we mean it this, uh, carrot and stick policy from European Union, from United States, from other countries as well. Let's say, because these uh, peace processes, as you know, are very fragile. Anytime you know, uh, we can see provocations. So European Union or United States or other countries can play a kind of a carrot and stick policy. They just can say, whichever side violates the peace processes, I'm just going to sanction them, whatever, this can be a stick. Or uh, if you continue with the peace process, we are just going to open, let's say, credits or you know, other issues to for the welfare of the Azerbaijani or Armenian or Georgian people. And with that, no, we have a failure, as you know, Nana. Georgia wanted to turn its face to West, as you know, 15 years ago. What happened to Georgia is a terrible story, terrible failure, because Russia was not happy with it in its back garden, a country trying to be a democracy and turning its ways to the West. 
Now Armenia is trying to do that, getting rid of the now Russian influence and turning its face to, to the West. So Russia is not happy with it as well. And Azerbaijan are good allies with Russia, Israel, and Turkey. Now they think they are so strong, you know, and they have so much leverage, they can put so much pressure on Armenia. I guess this is a mistake. Azerbaijan needs to come to its ter terms that if we don't regionalize this conflict, you know, these uh, conflicts are going to go forever, and Turkey, Iran, and Russia will have ambitions over uh, Caucasus, so we will never be independent countries. For this, I guess the best solution is regionalizing the conflict, opening the borders, having trade deals. Let's say it is, let's say uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan and Georgia, both of them, three of them, all of them are very beautiful countries. You know, it can, they can have together uh, in ten, 10 years, I believe 20 million tourists, which can benefit all of these countries or trade together. And those countries are at the crossroads between South and North, let's say from East to West, near Silk Road. So I think there's a huge potential with the peace. So we need to focus on it and just give a regional character to the conflict. I guess things will be easier if we regionalize the conflict. Thank you, Nana. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Uh, Uli, Ulvia, maybe you want to ask your question now? Introduce yourself. Thank you, guys. Um, I have to leave, unfortunately, for another meeting. But um, Daro, nice to meet you. My name is Ulvia. I go by Uli. I'm originally from Baku, Azerbaijan. I grew up there. And now I live in Los Angeles. Um, I moved in Uni to United States in 2001. And um, I started, uh, I did my first Azeri-Armenian dialogue in 2007, actually, with our friend Phil Gamagelan, many of you know. Of course um, I know. Yeah, he's wonderful. So um, this is just, a, I, I, this is not my profession. I'm in the ice cream industry, completely different. <laughs> but I, this has been kind of a, um, um, I don't even want to call a hobby of mine. I think the older I get, I'm realizing more of like my way of therapy. Um, my maternal grandfather is from Ahdam. Um, we've had seven to eight generations there. Um, and my paternal grandmother and grandfather are from villages called Ashahu Eskipara, Yuhar Eskipara. They're in the um, Gaza region. Um, they're currently still under occupation. They're next to Armenian village Voskipar. Um, so one of them is an enclave in Armenia. So unfortunately, as a child, um, I'm almost 40 years old. So unfortunately, as a child, I saw a lot of kind of the late 80s and 90s. Um, and I've been very interested in dialogue since, especially because my family tried very hard to bring me up with stories of coexistence. So until the late 80s, there, there were a lot of beautiful moments, which both my mom and my father have told me about. Um, the the reason why I gave you this background is because the question that I've been the the question that I've been struggling with the most when I do dialogues is the conflation of the Azerbaijani Armenian and also the uh, Armenian Turkish relations. You know, ever since I've and, and I believe there's a lot of nuances and we have to keep the two separate, even though they're very related. And I know that you are in Turkey and I and I applaud you for being very brave and always um, being true to your roots, but also speaking for dialogue and coexistence. I think we need more voices like yours. Um, what could you share with us in terms of the nuances that you use to kind of keep the two relations different? I mean, we are related. And I, when I started doing dialogue, I learned for the first time that Armenians refer to Azerbaijanis as Turks. So it's very easy to kind of, to lump the two things together. However, in my personal experiences, I've lived through some of it, maybe not directly, I lived in Baku, but indirectly, the two things have always to me, the Caucasus have felt very different. And um, so any advice you could give us and, you know, and if anyone from this group just kind of you know, maybe take this as like, 
a request from Azerbaijani police to always kind of try to separate the two as much as possible because it's really hard for me when I when I speak about my experiences and it almost becomes like victim Olympics. It's like, well, you your people suffered, but do you know what happened in 1915? And we will never win that. <laughs> you know, yes, it's sir. it's a dead end. It's like, oh, okay, so. Yes, I am an Azerbaijani that believes Armenian genocide happened. Unfortunately, uh, it's not a very popular um, 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 stance about, among my countrymen. And I think what, what changed my mind was the dialogues that I did since 2007. But it's really hard for me. And I literally, at that point, I shut down and I stopped talking. And I say, okay, you win. I lose. I'm sorry if I talk too much. <laughs> No, uh, no, Olivia, it was very important. No, no suffering uh, is uh, no, no bigger than other sufferings because you have a story which hurt you. Now we have stories and because, no, I heard so much from my grandparents, you know, what we did, what we suffered, of course. And, but this doesn't say, this is not, uh, I don't have a right to say, oh, we suffered so big. So uh, Azari suffering doesn't you know, count. No, it, it's not important in 1992. Or none of the Azaris have right to say pe how people have suffered in Baku, Sumgai, those years. Or now this, so this is why I am saying we need to decouple these issues. No. Look, every suffering, you know, uh, uh, no, uh, in 1915, there was a suffering because, you no, know, oh, that crime was unpunished. That is why unpunished crimes lead to new crimes. And it there was a hatred cycle. There was a crime cycle between na nations. Now it is time to break it, break it cycle. First, while I offer is, the first thing is avoiding the coming war. I say there is 51% of peace, 49% of war, let's say today. My percentage is less. But no, 49% of war is a big chance, big you know, thing. Because Turkey, nowadays, I, what I see is Azerbaijan is less vocal about war, but Turkey is more vocal about war. Uh, Turkish President Erdogan says, oh, if Armenians don't open that corridor, we are going to do it. No. Over another country's you no know, territory, open a corridor with fo by force, which is not which is not going to help anybody. Maybe then Pashinyan uh, government is going to end, and pro-Russian go government will be established in Armenia, and which is going to throw all the you no know, democratic institutions out of Armenia, which is going to make Armenia as a Belarus in the South Caucasus. Is it in favor of Azerbaijan? Is it in favor of Azeri people? Is it in favor of Turkey? No, but unfortunately, all, all the hardliners of the, all the nations don't think what is going to happen, they say, next, no? They only focus on their ambitions, Turkey Pantronist ambitions, or Mr. Aliyev might think, oh, Tur Armenia's humiliated me, me for 30 years. Now it is time for me to humiliate Armenians, but it is not in favor of Azeris at all. No, every day, no, we heard about two Azeri soldiers died, no, and four Armenian soldiers died. No, lately I'm not hearing, I'm so happy about it. No, late, late two weeks, it's not happening, but it can happen anytime again. No, all of them are my brothers and sisters. No, in Nagorno Karabakh war, that they said, oh, Azeris won the war, but they had 4,000 casualties. 4,000 mothers and fathers cried all those years. And Armenians had 4,000 casualties at the same time. Now, what have happened, uh, no, uh, lived is lived. No, we can't, we will not be able to take back our grandparents. But I'm sure if my grandparent, uh, mother Xenush was alive today, he, she would recommend me, Garo, let's, let's forget about me for today. Just focus on, you know, avoid to avoid the coming war, first of all. We need to first avoid the war, coming war, then start to engage, of course. 
then start the reconciliation processes. But those reconciliation processes should never say, even you no know, one uh, Armenians or one Azeri is suffering. No, it, sh it should not ignore it. You no, know, any of the su sufferings, Armenia needs to uh, just uh, face the Hojala massacre. That is what I believe. This doesn't mean Armenia is responsible of it or not. Whatever, uh, who is responsible? No, we need to really start the reconciliation processes and start the investigations. Let's say whoever is uh, responsible of it. Really, we need to just do it because to heal the souls of the you no know, uh, uh, Azeris, you no, know? and Azerbaijan needs to start the reconciliation process about Sungait, you no, know, let's say Baku massacres or what ha what has been done in Nagorno Karabakh. Why that hatred cycle hit one hundred thousand Armenians who had to flee from their country? I still have hope, really, Olivia. If you no, know, we can establish peace in the coming months or years, let's say, some Armenians would want to go back to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh or Karabakh, you call, I don't know, whatever, Arsa. No, whatever the name, I guess you need to decide together. No, be, because I believe in it. No, your grandparents used to live together. I heard so many stories about in Susha, Azeris and Armenians living together. We should have these dreams. No, Germany, uh, you should read books about Germany and uh, France. During the peace processes, both sides blame each other. We cannot be friends with you know, Germany. We cannot be friends with France. Look at Look where they are. They don't even have a border now they can coexist in that those uh, geography now we need to have those kind of dreams enough is enough we can't bring our grandparents our uh, loved ones back but with with starting to engage start uh, and avoid the coming war and we can just save the future casualties. That is what we need to focus on. And of course, having a dream about coexistence. Some people call me, you are naive, you are a romantic. Okay, I'm a, I must admit, I'm a romantic politician. But the only way is this. I believe in peace. And in the thought caucuses, we can, we can establish that peace. Uh, and there is a window of opportunity. We shouldn't let this window lose this window of opportunity. In 1996, we had that window of opportunity. But hardliners, unfortunately, didn't let it. Because of maximalist demands, it didn't happen. In 2008, we had that window of opportunity. Even in 2016, I know when I was in the parliament, there was a window of opportunity. Now there is another window of opportunity. We should benefit from it and just sign the peace deal and start to engage. And really, that, that those enclaves are very important. Now, sometime Turkey and Army, uh, Greece was about to fall in the war because of a very simple island. You no, know, in 1994. No, so it it is mine or yours. You no. Know? There needs to be a commission and with the international observers, I, I guess, for the border demarcation, I guess those uh, enclaves will be the subject of that commission as well. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you both. Um, following the topic, I will invite now Ralph to ask his question and turn on his microphone and camera. Hey, um, maybe I will not turn on my camera because I'm in bed listening to this, but uh, 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 hi, Garo. It's uh, really nice hi. to meet you. Um, and uh, I, I just had a question about something you mentioned. Um, you said Azerbaijan uh, drives uh, Turkey's uh, foreign policy when it comes to the Caucasus. I've always wondered, I, I share that view. Um but I'm wondering why that's so, uh, because Azerbaijan is a, uh, you know, by all objective standards, a much weaker country than Turkey. Why does it have such a strong chokehold on Turkey's foreign policy? Um, I'm I'm curious about your opinion. Uh, <laughs> because you know, uh, there is a saying in Turkey, you know, whoever gives the money. Uh, 
and just uh, uses the drum, you know. <laughs> Whistle. It, it is like that, you know. Uh, Turkish system is financed by Azerbaijan, and your taxpayers' money, your oil, oil money, is laundering in Turkey, which should be really, uh, you know, spent for Azerbaijan people. That's what I believe. And Azerbaijan is buying arms from Turkey, buying so many goods and investing in Turkey, buying companies, and of course, uh, delivering envelopes, as I told to the journalists, no? This is not in favor of Azerbaijani people, that's what I believe, but to build leverage in Turkey, Azerbaijan used this strategy, but it was clever, I have to admit, but it was, it was not good at all for the peoples of Armenia or Azerbaijan. So they are just they are just controlling Turkish policy, which uh, what the Turkish policy should be uh, for the South Caucasus, and uh, with the media control, with the economic control, it is a small country. Look, Qatar is a small country, smaller than uh, Azerbaijan, but the money is coming from Qatar to Turkey, let's say, uh, for the from the Arab countries. So. Uh, it is like this. Now, whoever gives the money, they control the system. It is like that. But, you know, what I see is another issue. Uh, Israel uh, and Azerbaijan are allies. And uh, Isra Azerbaijan have built so much leverage using the Israel leverage, let's say, because Israel thinks Azerbaijan will be important to reign Iran in the coming years. And uh, Azerbaijan have controlled Turkish policy by, with money, but I, I believe these are the money, the, this money is the money should be spent for the welfare of the Azerbaijani people. From now on, I guess we need to focus on it and just stop paying the, those money to the uh, media system in Turkey. That's what I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will invite now Nilufer to ask your second question that you had submitted, please. Okay. Hello, I am Nilufer. I am from Turkey. Um, I am Sesim Gel. Um, Geliyor. Can you hear me? Yeah, ah, I okay. hear you. I'm going to talk to 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 you. Can Tur can Turkey's equality movements uh, contribute peace between um, Armenia and Azerbaijan, especially about Karabakh conflicts? Can you repeat your question, Fernando? I'm sorry. Okay. Can Turkey's equality movements contribute peace between? Um, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Okay, I got your question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Nilüfer. Yes, it can, of course. But look at Tur Tur look, Turkey is where we, Turkey is. No, Erdogan is saying, uh, Israel, you shouldn't bomb, uh, let's say, Palestinians in Gaza. Huh? I'm sure, you no, know, Israel would say someday, someday, no. Turkey has been bombing Kurds, let's say in Roger, uh, Syria for years, you no, know, with drones, you no. Know. Of course, you no. Know, I I don't want to compare these issues like, like this. You no, know. it is maybe bigger, it is smaller. Uh, but the if you are doing something, let's say you you saying about peace in the you no know, uh, Israel or between Israel and Palestine, Erdogan wants to be the mediator, but. Everybody thinks when you are repressing Kurds, when you are jailing Kurds, when you are not uh, respecting Kurdish rights, or when you are just supporting Azerbaijan to end this conflict with, with, with the war and causing the exodus of the Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh, how can you be a mediator? It same goes to the Turkish people. No, Erdogan followed these policies, that, you know, uh, polarizing the nation, and putting pressure on Kurds. Still, of course, the elections was not fair, that fair, much fair, but still the majority of the Turkish people voted for Erdogan. 
And on the opposition camp, unfortunately, they were saying, oh, he is nationalist. We are more nationalist than them. No, we are just going to throw all the refugees from Turkey, just rep continue repressing the Kurds, whatever. So this means that Turkish people nowadays, unfortunately, with the media bra brainwashing, is, uh, Turkish people are not in favor of peace, unfortunately. They were in favor of peace only 50, 10, 15 years ago, but nowadays they are not. So for this, we are not an example, unfortunately, anymore, Nilifer. But you no, know, Turkey doesn't have an equality movement anymore. Turkey doesn't have peace, you no, know, peace movement anymore. 15 years ago, let's say, 10 years ago, everybody was in favor of Kurdish conflict peace process, but Erdogan jailed all the leaders of the, those moments. And because of the fear factor, er nobody is in charge. So what we need to do, what you need to do as a new generation, need to build this peace movement, equality movement. Again, we need to do it together to just then help the people of Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia or help the people of Palestine. You know, but first we need to uh, do the window dressing first of all about this because we are in a terrible situation then maybe we can help other nations thank you thank you both um now i will invite um moses to ask his first question which was very similar to a question that renata hirova had submitted but i don't think she's here um, so, Moses, please. Uh, uh, um, uh, Mr. Diego, uh, I, I, I apologize. I don't have the question on me. Uh, I think I just sent it and it got sent on the web browser. And so I didn't have a copy of it. Um, sure. Can you can you text it to me or, or through the chat and I'll read it? Yeah. I mean, it, it was uh, with a very long introduction. So Yes, yes. I'm going to skip the introduction. Okay. Um. Uh it says it's too long. <laughs> yeah. Just but, just give me the the second half of it in the... <laughs> Yeah. Um in the meanwhile you can start with the introduction Moses. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh uh Mr. Pylon, um uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you and to meet you. I've always wanted to meet you. I've been following you since 2015 and uh I mean, uh, you know, a lot of us that we we idolize you. You find you kind of a hero. Uh, especially for some of us diaspora Armenians who wish to someday uh, perhaps return to Turkey, um, because that's where I see uh, my homeland, my Vatan to be. Um, and, you know, looking at you and in looking at some other people such as yourself, uh, it gives us a little bit of hope that there's there's place for Armenians to participate and to be part of civic society and, and the free and democratic and equal equal turkey um so uh what yeah so what i wanted to ask you about is what do you think what role could civil society have i think you just touched on it just a minute ago um uh, because since the governments are not doing it themselves and perhaps it, it should be from 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 grassroots from human face-to-face -face interactions how much how how much likelihood do you see with civil society being able to uh, through our own initiative to be able to create some kind of uh, different kinds of dialogue and mutual understanding, perhaps learning one another's language, perhaps seeing things about one another's history and, and just sharing face-to-face ex -face experiences. Uh, uh, because, you know, there is that theory that when you see a person face-to-face, -face, you no longer think of them as a monster. Um, you see the, you see the human being in them. And uh, how how likely is it, how possible is it that Armenians and Turks and Azerbaijanis uh, can start engaging in civil society interactions um, and, and, and try to build this trust from ground up instead of relying on our corrupt often or unreliable governments to do it? Okay, uh, it is a very important question, uh, Moses, thank you. But, you know, I, just, I, I guess there's a problem with the identification of this. You said one an, another's history we need to learn about. I believe you can't separate Armenian history from 
Turkish history because it is a common history. We lived together, we coexisted together for centuries. You no, know? some Armenian nationalists try to do it. Oh, this is the Armenian history. We were there. Blah, blah, blah. Like we we didn't live with Turks and Greeks and Kurds for centuries. No, they just try to separate that from the Turkish history. Like, like some Turkish nationalists do it. Or you said, learn each other's language. I know, I'm sure you know some Turkish words because your ancestors might have no, known it. No, because we live together. We all know, we knew each other's language. And Turkish is a common language. You need to know that. Let's say only 20% of the Turkish language is no original Turk, Turkish language from the Middle East, the, the, the Middle Asia. No, 20% of it is in Persian, 20% is Arabic. Let's say there are 5% of it is Armenian, 10% Greek, 5% Georgian, this and that. So this is a common language, which just in that melting pot, we were together in Anatolia, and created a language, and it was a beautiful language with 30,000 lang languages. Then nationalists came and said, oh, this is only Turk Turks language. And I, they put pressure on others to just learn this language, forget about their language, which, which was um, not a, a healthy policy. So I believe we need to rethink about how we uh, identify Turks you know, in our mind, let's say, because we were taught that Turks just killed us and they are our enemies. You no, know, they need to do this, they need to do that. And we are the diaspora of Armenia. I fully you know, I have an objection to this identification. First of all, Turks are not our enemies. Cause you no, know, how could I live in Turkey then? How could I be the member of the Turkish parliament? How could I speak there? Because millions of Turks believe that we need to coexist with Tur Armenians, with Kurds. That is how I could survive, despite so many assassination attempts, so many you know, uh, atrocities, this and that. Of course, there was several lynch attempts. Of course, whenever I spoke about rights of Armenians or other Armenian genocide, blah, blah. But you know, this is the only way I know because we are from Anatolia, South Caucasus, Mesopotamia, and all the nations are there, the Turks, Kurds, Azeris, or Ar 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 Armenians. Then now the only way is this, you no, know, the world have entered another dark era, Moses, believe in me. Uh, the world have entered first in the, before the first world war entered the, uh, no, uh, dark era, and it ended with the catastrophe, First World War. Then the Second World War was the second catastrophe. Now the world have entered a dark, dark era. If we can't establish peace in our region, in the South Caucasus, in Anatolia, and with the Kurds, and I'm sure what is going on in Israel will have so much impact in our region, and it is going to create the further wars and catastrophes. So, we need, instead of seeing Turk as an enemy, what my offer is this, see him or her as your neighbor or the one who used to live together. First, we need to start to see him or her as a neighbor. Then when we engage or start to live together, have dreams about just uh, cultural issues, the, uh, economic issues, then we start to see them as the, uh, identity which we used to live together and having dreams about we can live together again. Start with, and Turks need to do it at, at the same time. Our enemy is not Turks. Our enemy is uh, a genocidal idea which has been carried by ultra-nationalist Turks. Or my enemy is can never be Azeris. No, uh, Armenians and Azeris cannot be enemies. We need to underline this sentence: cannot be enemies. The ultra-nationalist Armenians and ultra-nationalist Azeris filled Armenians and Azeris with the hatred of Azeris and Armenians. We need to get out of it. 
uh, you some Armenians can say Azerbaijanis are eighty percent responsible for it. We are twenty percent, but responsible for it. Maybe vice versa, whatever. Starting to if you start to blame each other, it will be another race as well. So we need to get out of it. Just start to see Azeris first of all as our neighbors. Then start to see, talk to our ancestors, of course, grandparents. Remember how they could live together, like Olivia said uh, 10 minutes ago. So, uh, but, you know, uh, Moses, I, I have to say this. Establishing peace is the hardest thing in the world. But doing war is the easiest thing, you know. That is why politicians follow the war, war way. Because it's so easy. Just find an enemy, put the blame on them, everything, buy arms, you no, know, just start wars and tell your nation is, oh, we need to save our nation, and there is an enemy. You no, know, it is the easiest way. But I what I believe is as Armenians, we need to pursue peace more. Because I'm sorry, it is the it is the it is the only way we need to follow. Thank you. Thank you. We are running out of time, um, so we are we only have time for two more questions. Um, and I'm sorry for those questions that we weren't able to or that we won't be able to include in this time. So, Elisa, I would like to invite you to ask one of your questions and introduce yourself. Thank you, Barif uh, Parum Pailan. First off. Uh, first off, uh, thank you for your time and uh, presence. It's uh, really an honor to meet you and uh, to speak to you. And also thanks to Bright Garden Voices for organizing this. So first of all, my name is Eliza. I'm from Yerevan, but uh, I'm a diaspora Armenian <clears throat> with roots from Mush in Western Armenia. Uh, by profession, I'm a culturologist, but I've been a long observer of geopolitics and sociocultural issues in the Caucasus. So let me uh, ask uh, the question that I have, which is <clears throat> the Armenian government recently presented the so-called Crossroads of Peace project in Tbilisi, as you probably know. And I'm interested to know what is your take on that? Because to be quite honest, uh, from what I've observed, the reactions in the Armenian community, both in the country and in the diaspora, really vary. And not surprisingly, I'm seeing a lot of skepticism and this skepticism comes from uh, the feeling that Azerbaijan and Turkey won't agree to this project without setting some preconditions. And um, I'm just curious, what is your take on that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elisa, by the way, we might be related. My grandmother uh, is from Mosh, no? <laughs> and, but she was an orphan. <laughs> No, in 1896, no, uh, during the first massacres. I don't know, we might be related. <laughs> we might be. <laughs> you know, um, I am so happy to see this project, first of all, because I have been telling about this for years, you know, for more than a decade. You no, know, uh, how can, no, Turkey and Greece have problems, let's say. Don't they? They have so many problems, but they have an open border. They are doing trade. Uh, highways are open. You no know, Turkish people can to, can go to Greece, and Greek people can come to you know, Turkey. What is the biggest obstacle uh, before the ultra nationals to not to do the war? Do you know the engagement of the Greek and Armenian Greek and Turkish people? Because they know when they go there, they see. They don't see an enemy. They see, no, because uh, don't take, uh, misunderstand me, my uh, Azeri friends. Turks and Armenians have more common things than Azer Azeris and Turks have. <laughs> you might object to this, but Turks and Armenians have more, you know, because we coexisted for 700 years you know, in Turkey, in every city. In every village, we coexisted together. Our music, our culture, our food, and so many things, e almost everything, we coexisted together. So we have so much uh, common things than uh, no Azeris have. Look, now when Turks go to Greece, when they see somebody like them, they see how can uh, Yorgo can be my enemy? 
But when uh, some Greeks come to Turkey, they see uh, rational Turks, democrat Turks, let's say, they welcome them, you know, and with a hug, and they say, how can Mehmet can be my enemy? We need this process, uh, uh, Eliza, believe me. If we open the borders and start engaging, we will see, sometimes we say, uh, as Armenians, Turk is a Turk. Don't we say it? Turk is a Turk, you know? Like all the Turks are the same. But if we say Turk is a Turk, you no, know, he ignore my friends. They just hundreds of thousands of uh, Turks and Kurds walked in during in the funeral of Ranting. Who are they then if Turk is a Turk? Uh, they commemorated the Armenian genocide at the Taksim Square with me, with thousands of Turks and Kurds. And then who are they? So we need to engage. We need to see that there are good Turks and so-called bad Turks. There are good Armenians, maybe so-called bad Armenians, and there are good Azeris and so-called bad Azeris, no, which we are not in favor of, but we need them on board as well. Bad Armenians, bad Azeris, bad Turks doesn't mean that. We need to convince them as well. With fights, with wars, all of us lost. Of course, Armenians maybe lost more than them, but Azeris have lost as well. Turks have lost as well. So with opening the borders, having this kind of projects really is the way to sustain peace, believe in me. No, why the nations don't do war? Because look at Turkey and Azeri, Turkey is shouting at Israel, don't, don't they? Yeah, they are shouting at, but they don't cancel trade, trade deals because it no, they know that it's going to hurt them. If nations start engaging with each other, doing trade, benefiting from each other. A tourist going to Yerevan, coming to one, or a tourist coming to one, going to Yerevan, or going to Baku, will they benefit from each other? Then this is, this is, the, this is going to be the biggest obstacle before a war. So engagements, let's say, uh, secure peace processes. If there is no engagement, then ultra-nationalist Azeris or Turks feel uh, the new generations with the hatred of Armenians, then we see the new coming wars. This is the, but no, I believe now Armenia is at stake. Peace is a necessity for us. And peace requires this kind of projects, opening the border, doing trade, whatever, engaging. Of course, some people are going to be biased. Some people will be skeptical saying that, oh, Armenia is going to be filled with Turkish goods. Turkish goods are not coming to Armenia. Over Georgia, it's coming and it's becoming more expensive. Doing direct trade, always no. That fear was in Turkey uh, 20 years ago during the EU processes. Do you know? The uh, some Turks said, if you open the borders with EU, Turkey will be filled with Tur uh, European goods. It didn't happen like that. Turkey have uh, ten made uh, ex its exports ten times higher than the European Union process. It was only twenty five billion dollars. Now it is two hundred and fifty million, million billion dollars. I guess it is going to benefit to Azerbaijan and Armenia more than it's going to help uh, uh, help Turkey. And moreover, the border cities are in favor of border opening. Now, if they they benefit from this opening the border. They are going to be the obstacle before another war. Let's, we should think about these issues. And I think we should be in favor of opening the borders and doing this kind of crossroads of peace projects. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, I'm sorry for those that we, we didn't select your questions this time. We're running out of time. So before uh, asking you, Mr. Pailan, to ask to give us some final words, I wanted to ask to take the liberty to ask a last question, which is uh, basically, what are your plans now? Um, well, like you, you just finished your mandate, and I, I believe you're not in the U.S. Do you plan to go back to Turkey? Um, what's next? Oh, okay. Uh in my party, there was a rule that you, you can run only for two terms, and I have handed uh, my two terms and uh, I ended my service in the Turkish parliament. And I am happy that I am I'm not elected again, because unfortunately, like Azeri parliament or uh, Azerbaijan parliament and other parliaments don't function. No, only one man rules Azerbaijan. It's like one man rules uh, Turkey, unfortunately. 
so uh, now I want to play a nonpartisan role and be more beneficial to, to normalize the Turkish-Armenian relations. And uh, I'm just going to focus on uh, peace in the South Caucasus. This is my plan. So I, my my one foot will be in Washington, D.C., and one foot in Armenia, and one foot in uh, Turkey, uh, of course, and uh, try to do threat to, to diplomacy, backdoor diplomacy, or direct diplomacy, and try to convince nations. And my, one uh, other goal is there is a very unhealthy relationship between Armenian diaspora and Armenia. It's a very unhealthy relation. No, Armenian diaspora unfortunately sees Armenia as a subject of their ambitions, but this is a very unhealthy relationship. Armenia is a country which is living in a very uh, hard geography. So I guess Armenian people needs to have more say on what about their future and diaspora needs to contribute to, to that policy. I guess peace agenda is the right agenda because of course peace is a necessity for Armenia. And I, I guess after that peace, we need to make Armenia somehow strong and independent, which can defend itself, of course, which can have a strong economy, which can deliver welfare to its people. And uh, Armenia has only two and a half million uh, population. It, it, we need to, uh, and I guess more Armenians will have dream to live in Armenia that kind of dreams we need to have, I guess. I'm just going to focus on those issues, but I'm not going to only work for Armenians. I'm just going to work for Turks, Kurds, Azeris, and Armenians. I guess those are my brothers, and we need to coexist together. That, that is going to be my dream, to be in sushi in the coming months or years, a bar, I don't know what bar is you know, in Azer Azeri word, but... Uh, play bar you no know, uh, together maybe drink an armenian or azeri cognac together and just enjoy uh, life in baku and maybe azeri is enjoying uh, their summer holiday at lake sewan you no know? those are the dreams of course it, for those dreams to come true i guess we all need to take responsibility and we need to really engage you know that's what we need to do. thank you very much for this opportunity Thank you, Mr. Pailan, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, Arnold, I don't know if you want to close, maybe? Uh, no, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, remember that this will be recorded. This will be made available on YouTube. Ja and... David has a word to say, I guess. David? Oh, no, I was just clapping. <laughs> okay. Thank okay, you. David. So, yeah. So, you can yeah. you can find our uh, recorded programs on YouTube, our Instagram, uh, follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Bright Garden Voices. Thank you so much, Mr. Pailan. Uh, it was an honor. It was a pleasure having you. Thank and, you. And uh, Diego. You may yeah, start. and thank you, everybody who joined for your questions, for your time. I'm sorry, those that we, we weren't able to select, but uh, hopefully we'll have further opportunities in the future. And thank you a lot once again, Mr. Pailan. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.